there. Today, we're going to talk about suffering and submission. <laughs> Favorite topic of everyone that I know. Because, boy, we just, you know, that's not really the line that we run to to sign up for, is it? And yet, Peter is talking a lot about that. He's writing to an audience which is suffering terribly. And he's trying to comfort them with the scriptures. And uh, if there's anything that would comfort anybody suffering, it would be the scriptures. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to go through chapter 3, which is a very interesting passage. We have been looking in uh, previous, uh, yesterday, uh, last week, about submission. And you'll, I just want you to note the word submission, because it, it kind of is like fingernails on a chalkboard for some people. In verse 13 in chapter 2, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to the governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. Any of you want to know what the will of God for your life is? There it is. That by doing good that you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Amen. So we went through that last week. And when you hear the word submission, you, you think of wrestling. And, you know, you get somebody that taps out and they, you know, that's a submission hold that you get them in. But submission is something that God has called us to, even unrighteous authority, which we talked about last week. Notice in verse 18, he says, servants... Be submissive, by the, word, by the way, that's the same word. Uh, it's hupatazo. Uh, servants, be submissive to your masters. Any of you got masters? Sure. Yeah. Got a boss yeah. You all got a boss, right? Well, all of you who work have a boss. Yeah, you got a master. Here you go. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. By the way, that doesn't mean that you cower when they raise their hand. It means that you have respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. But what, if, what credit is it if you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So we've looked at this crucified life that Christ calls us to be to, this obedient as his children, as his kids, we submit ourselves to the things that he says. And one thing is the government. Now, it might not be your candidate, but you should pray for them. Amen. It, you know, it, it might not be a good election, but you should pray. And it's not going to stop me from having to be obedient. Um, and I have to pay my taxes. I've got to do all that because the scripture, God tells me to do that. So I can shut the mouths of people that would unrighteously accuse the church. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Jesus says it again in Matthew 5, if you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. You guys have all heard this, right? Yeah. It's so easy because I can, I can memorize it and I can repeat it to you. But when the time comes and somebody hits me, there's a little switch in my head. You got one of those? Yeah, yeah. yeah I try to keep that box locked. But there's a switch in my head where I want to not just return in kind, but I wish to give them interest. <laughs> and Jesus says, if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, give them the other also. If somebody wants to sue you and take you to court and they, they want to take your tunic away, your, your outer garment, let them have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. That is the Christian life. You will not find any other religion on the face of the planet that says, do this. But Jesus does. And we can do that because we have the grace and the love of our God. And if, you, if you're filled with it, you've got more than enough to give away. And don't worry, he'll give you more. And so we learn to do this and trust in God, above all things, we're going to trust God in a situation like that, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you find it hard to do? Sometimes. Pray. Pray and ask God for strength, and he'll do it. So we talked about this last week. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. 
bless those who curse you. You know, the single finger salutes that you get on, on, on the highway. Uh, God bless you. Pray Jesus saves you. Yeah. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who despitefully or spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. So we look like him. We look like we belong to him. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same? But if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, if we're truly followers of Jesus Christ, we need to walk in his steps. We need to do what he did. And he left us an example that we should follow. Not just a scapegoat to take the burden of sin away from us so that we don't ever have to suffer. Some people would preach that. But the scripture doesn't teach that. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. We can take an example from that, can't we? Who himself bore our sins on his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see, Jesus has left us this example, and if anyone was innocent, it was him. Now, if somebody slaps you in the face, maybe you deserve it. Maybe you don't. But I can tell you, you deserve it more than Jesus did. And he was innocent, completely innocent, and he absorbed it all. That was an example for us. So don't forget that. Because as we jump into 1 Peter chapter 3, we wish to remind Carl again, happy birthday, Carl. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sure it's other people's birthday too. But I don't want to embarrass everyone. So we're going to go into 1 Peter chapter 3. How many of you are familiar with 1 Peter chapter 3? First Peter, there's a woman. Yeah, okay. First Peter chapter 3. Oh, a man. Okay, there's a man who knows First Peter chapter 3. That's dangerous, you know, because the scripture can be a weapon at times. First Peter chapter 3 comes out with some very bold, countercultural, non-woke statements. And so we're going to look at them with the authority of Jesus Christ. Number one, wives, likewise, in the same way, as we've been reading about submitting to the government, about submitting to people who are mistreating you. In the same way, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, meaning the husbands, without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, uh, that word in the original is called phobos, where we get the word phobia, it actually means to have reverence, to have awe, to have respect. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, not even a whisper, (laughs) whose daughters you are, If you do good and are not afraid with any terror, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Thank you for coming today. (laughs) As a man who is married Uh, I can come off as being very proud and arrogant and chauvinistic, 
as I go through this study, but I want you to remember that this is what the Word of God teaches. And God who created male and female and created them to be married, created it to work in a certain way, with a certain order, without which you will be the other plus 50% where marriages don't work. Because this is the way that it works. So, wives, so if you're single, I want to hear a hallelujah. hallelujah. You don't have to submit to your husband. But I want a man. No, you don't. You will have to submit to him. Oh, don't do it. Listen, marriage counseling in part is trying to convince people they shouldn't get married. And if they overcome all your objections, then you do it. You get them married. Because getting married is hard. I'm going to say, amen, brother. Amen. That yes. marriage is hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Great. I'd love to tell you more. <laughs> Wives, likewise, be submissive means to be under their authority to your own husbands. Aren't you glad it doesn't say husbands in general? Yeah. And then all wives would have to submit to all husbands. But no, 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 to your own husband. There's a unique relationship, and notice there's one husband and there's one wife in this scenario, just so you get that. That's God's plan from the beginning. So, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, the husbands, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Boy, there's a lot in this passage. You've got to go all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. If you remember what happened, God created Adam. He put him in the garden. He made everything beautiful. And it says that it was good. In fact, every day it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. Then he comes to Adam and he goes, it's not good. That man is alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And then almost like a commercial, it goes to, and the Lord brought every animal to Adam to see what he would name it. Okay. Big long nose, elephant. Big sharp nose, rhinoceros. And by the way, all those names actually have a phylogeny, uh, phylogenetic, there's a background where you're describing what it looks like. And eater. A lot of, real, very creative there. So, and it says at the end of naming all the animals that there was not found for him a suitable partner. He couldn't have fellowship with the animals. Nice dog, but you know, oh look, a butterfly, and they're gone. That's different than a mate. That's different than a wife. And he had something going on where he was, it was not good that he was alone. So God caused this great sleep to fall on Adam. <clears throat> he fell asleep. He took his side. Actually, the better translation is a side, not a rib, an individual piece of your side. But he took a side of the man and created him. Guess which side he took? The feminine side. Thank you. You well-taught people. Takes the feminine side out of him and creates a woman. Uh, wakes him up and says, uh, Adam says, whoa, man. <laughs> This is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. She shall be called woman because she came out of a man. He was on a naming streak. He hadn't named all the animals. By the way, that's a position of authority to name something. Jesus comes on the scene. He renames a few people. You guys, sons of thunder. <laughs> you, you're Peter instead of Cephas. It's a position of authority. Didn't tell Eve probably exactly what happened before she showed up because the serpent shows up and he says, did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And she said, no, no. He said, we can't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden and we can't touch it or else we'll die. You know, God never said, don't touch it. She had in her head not to touch. It probably was Adam putting in her head, listen, see that tree? Don't eat from the fruit. 
In fact, for you, don't even touch it. <laughs> but you see, the problem with adding to God's word is the problem if she goes over and touches it and nothing happens, then nothing happens. And it doesn't seem like God really said anything. And it causes distrust, right? Because whenever we add to God's word, we mess it up. That was the first bit of legalism that hit, <laughs> hit um, the earth was right there, adding to God's law. So beware of that. If it doesn't come from the scriptures, then it's somebody's opinion. Take it with a grain of salt, and if it's a good idea, do it. If it's not, abandon it, right? But if it's in the word, we need to do it. So we go all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve. Eve reaches out and takes of the fruit. By the way, it doesn't say an apple, but everybody thinks it was. It could have been a fig. Because right after that, they covered up with fig leaves. So she reaches out and she looks at the, at the fruit. She sees that it is pleasant to the eye. It's desirable to make one wise. And it's good for food. So why shouldn't I eat that? That's what I say to every cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> and it says that she took and she ate. And she gave to her husband who was with her. What? I mean, Adam's just like saying, all right, whatever. <laughs> He's there. Now, we don't know if he showed up. We don't know if he was with her. We don't know if he was at 7-Eleven getting a coffee. We don't know where he was. But he was with her, which means at the moment that that all transpired, Adam said nothing. He should have run and dove on that fruit. But he didn't. And then after the deed was done, can you imagine... My wife is now condemned to die. Oh, well, sucks to be you, you know. But, but he didn't do that. He took and he ate as well. And we see that Jesus, as the second Adam, does that for the bride. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. So if you go all the way back to the beginning, all of this happens. And then what happens is, you know, there are consequences to our actions, right? He told Adam, the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die, or death will begin to hold you, if you will. Genesis 3.16, as he's going, he went to the serpent. He, he called out and said, Adam, where are you? It's not because God couldn't find him. It's because he wanted Adam to realize he's hiding. For the first time ever in their relationship, he's hiding. And so God says, Adam, where are you? He doesn't call for her. He calls for him. He knows everything that happened, but who's he holding accountable? Adam, because he was there first. He told him specifically. So he goes to the serpent and he says, on your belly you will crawl all the days of your life. You'll eat dust. By the way, you remember what man was made out of? Dust. 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 <laughs> Curious. You'll eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed called the proto event uh, you don't care. Anyway, it's the first time the gospel actually gets hinted at, that there'll be a savior. There's going to be a problem between Satan and the woman. Why the woman? Because Jesus was virgin born. He's talking about the seed of the woman and the seed of the devil. Everybody's the seed of the devil except for one who bypassed man, who was Jesus. He goes to the woman and he says, what is this that you have done? Well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And she says, okay. God says to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In other words, you're going to have babies, but it's going, to be, it's going to be worse now that sin's involved. In fact, your main ministry, which is about the home and about giving birth to children, is now contaminated with sin. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. This is what we call the curse. And that's why you have an order. That's why you have 1 Peter chapter 3. Because there's a curse that is put on mankind because of sin. Just so that you understand, that's why. Not because men are smarter, more spiritual, or smell better. None of that is true. 
What a captive audience you are. (laughs) So this is why this structure exists. This is a consequence of the fall. There's a structure and an order. So your desire, wife, woman, will be to be the husband. Your desire will be to take the wheel, have control, take charge, make decisions, and hand off to your husband who's with you. That's the consequence of sin. (laughs) that's a misquote anyway consequence of the fall just so that you understand why this is here 1st Timothy 2 11 to 15 says let a woman learn in silence with all submission I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man but to be in silence now he's not talking about wives he's talking about women different word For Adam was formed first and then Eve. So that's the reason. Not education. Because Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So you see, it's a result of the fall. This order. Nonetheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. In other words, wives... Your struggle with your husband for dominion and control and authority is going to be done away with because you got something to do. You got kids. And how many of you men know that your wife has a better relationship with your kids than you? My wife spent way more time with my kids than me because I was busy working, sometimes two jobs. So I was the guy that came home every once in a while, and they said, Daddy! You know, and I was the good guy, and my wife was the bad guy, because she had to be the bad guy all week. But you see, my wife didn't struggle and say, you know, I want to be, I want to be a feminine, I want to be a masculine woman. I want to go out and get me a job and be a professional and be intelligent and have multiple degrees and prove to the world that I'm as smart as any man. She didn't have that struggle. She had too much to do. She was raising our kids. And I'll tell you what, it's a large part due to her teaching and discipleship of our children that they know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's better than any job. And my grandkids and my in-laws. And praise God, it trickles down. It's worth it. So the consequence of the fall is this order. And just so that you know, it's not just in one place in the scripture where a woman bears a particular part of the image of God that a man does not. There are two genders, male and female. They're given to you at birth. On occasion, there are problems, but it is like a point zero, some number under that. The rest of it is because people are nurtured into questioning their identity. It's because of trauma, or it's because of exposure, or it's because of the television, it's because of friends, it's because of going to a public school where a stripper comes in and reads you a story. It comes because of this, and there's confusion. If you ever see, you ever see little boys play? Mm -hmm. They always pull their shirt off. (laughs) They're always wrestling. They're grabbing and pulling and taunting, and they're laughing. You don't see girls doing that. You got girls whipping their shirt off, and they're pulling and tugging. You're in a wrong place. But little boys will do that all the time, and they'll make anything into a gun. You don't even have a stick. You got a finger. Boys love to wrestle. When I go to see my grandsons, first thing they do is they run headlong into my body. They put their head down, and I'm like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> if you have boys, you better own a mitt or have big hands to, to, because that's exactly what they're going to do. And they want, like, I'll throw them around, and <laughs> they love it. You don't do that to a little girl. Little girls. <laughs> when I greet kids here, I take note. You're a girl. I'm going to treat you like a princess. You're a young boy. You're a future warrior. (laughs) And that's the way I treat them. When we have a men's retreat, I talk to the men very differently than I talk to the women. 
This is a mixed group, so there's a little bit of each, so I have to apologize to both sides. <laughs> People are different, and there's no use trying to deny that there are differences. There are differences in brain, there's differences in biology, there are differences in the way men and women think. Their accidents are different. Did you know that? If you look up the statistics, anyway. I'm getting way off track here. <laughs> be submissive. Boy, you know, when it says be submissive to the government, okay, you know, all right, I'm okay with that. You know, servants you should be, or slaves, you should be submissive to your masters. Okay, you know, I could take that. But then if you're a wife and you hear be submissive to your husband, that strikes a certain harmonic, doesn't it? Yes. Like there's something wrong here. <laughs> But it's not. It's the same thing. It's just that you have a hard time trusting God. <coughs> Listen, I've had, I've had some pretty rotten bosses, and I've treated them well. I've had some pretty good bosses, and I haven't treated them very well. This is what God calls us to, and we can't do it in our flesh because we don't want to. We don't want to. If I was a woman, I wouldn't want to submit to me. I'm, t I'm telling you, I'm a knucklehead. <laughs> Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Yeah, just so you know, this is the actual original word. It's hupatazo, which is from the Greek. It means to be subordinate. It means to, it's a military term, actually. It means to be under rank or under authority. Like some, some soldier in a row would, would, would be to his commanding officer. It's a military term. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that they're worthy of it. It just means that there's somebody in charge because without it, you don't have order, right? If we defund the police and everyone's gonna take care of everyone, how's that gonna go? Because there's no one in charge, there's no order. You see, you don't have people in authority saying, you can't steal that stuff, you can't walk out of the store with this. Right? And then what happens, you know, when something really goes loose and there's guns and bullets flying and you call the police but they're not there? That actually happened in Oregon when they cried out and we want to be our own place and, you know, peace and love will prevail. No, the sin nature will prevail is what happens. You have to have order. You have to have people in authority. This is what it looks like when you are in submission to somebody who's in authority, this is the, the idea that some wives have of what it is to submit to their husbands. <laughs> He's Adolf Hitler is what it is. And no, that is a wrong way to look at it. Being submissive. So ladies who are not married, pick the right guy. If you're not willing to submit to him, don't marry him. If you see issues where you can't trust him, don't do it. Because you're seeing the best version of him when you're dating. The best version. You know, he smells good. He's showered. He's shaved. When you get married, that's as good as it gets. So if that's not acceptable... And he's, he's got some kind of a prideful, cocky, non-apologetic arrogance going on. It's only going to get worse. I hate to tell you. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ can do a work in his heart. And that's what this passage is about. Because you're locked into a covenant before God, it's not a contract. It's not, well, listen, I'll do for you as long as you do for me. Oh, well, that's good because I'll always do for you and you just do for me. But the minute you don't do for me. I'm done. That's a contract. That's like a business contract. Oh, yeah? Well, if, if I'm not getting what I want, or what I deem I want, when I want, as I want, I'm done. You can't do that. You're in a covenant. You know, when two people get married, you say, I will, I will. You didn't say, I will if. It's I will. I do. So make sure you know what you're doing when you do it because you could be getting yourself in a headlock. And I understand that. Being submissive is a difficult thing. And yet it says it all throughout the scriptures in Colossians 3:18 to 19. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord because that's what people of God do. 
Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. This passage seems somewhat equal, doesn't it? Wives, husbands. The problem is wives are always busy telling the husbands their part and husbands are always telling the wives their part. Are any of you married? <laughs> you know this is true. Man, I got screwed. Submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Ah, you people are no fun. Okay. <laughs> I have to be good. My wife's in the room. <laughs> First Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. Notice, men, you're supposed to be teaching your wife. Amen. Doesn't mean you're smarter than her, but it means you're responsible. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, there's a whole cultural background thing into that, and I'd, I would love to take off on that one day, but not today. Ephesians chapter 5, wives, submit to your own husbands. You get the idea? It seems to be everywhere. Wow. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, as if he were Jesus Christ himself. For the husband is the head of the wife, uh, authoritatively, as also Christ is the head of the church, authoritatively. For he is the savior of the body. And men, you are the savior of your wives. That's the way God designed it to be. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. everything. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, that's the commitment. That's what the scripture asks. That's not very fun for, for my wife. Anyway. Oh, God help me. And so... This is what the scripture teaches. This is how it's done. Now, men, you could make it very easy for your wife or you could make it so hard. If you are an arrogant, self-seeking, non-submissive man and all you want is the video game, you want the new car, you want to go play golf, or you want to go out and play with your buddies, you want, and you neglect your wife, your kids, and your responsibility at home, you make it hard for your wife to submit to you. Don't do that. Because we're going to get to the men part, girls, okay? So it's all right. We'll get there. In Matthew 5, 38 and 42, it says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. Remember we went through that verse? It applies in marriage as well. Do not resist an evil person. I have to do this too. It's not just for a wife toward a husband. It's for a husband towards everybody. Not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other also. He wants to sue you and take away your tunic, give him your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. That sounds like submission to me. And Christ asks us all to do that. Towards evil people. Not somebody you married and you picked them. Everybody. So this isn't exclusive, just so you know. First Peter 2.18, we covered it last week. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but... When you do good and suffer and you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Why do we compartmentalize marriage apart from all of this? Because this is what the scripture tells me and you to do. Which means sometimes it's my wife. Sometimes it's my wife who's being mean and nasty. Yes. Yeah. 
it says here that even if some of them do not obey the word, now there are very good men who translate this as these men are not Christians. They do not claim the name of Christ, nor do they submit to the word of God. But what it is, is they don't obey the word. I'd like to see a show of hands. Men who are married in this room, how many of you at some point in your life did not obey the word of God? I got two hands up, okay? Because the more that you know, the more you're supposed to do. So my wife, the greatest ability she has to be an influence in my life is to not say anything. That's what it says. This is not a teaching moment. This will not change anyone. And if it does, it's going to be surface at best. Right? Wow, I must be hitting a real nerve here today. Ladies, if you treat your husband like a little child... And if you decide you're going to get loud and, and, and dramatic and overly emotional and you're going to use words that are full of, of anger, you can cause him to wilt into neutral where he will not lead and he will not stand up for himself and he won't defend you and he won't provide for you and he won't do all of the things that he promised at the altar he would do. You can influence him to such a point where he just shuts off. Click. And he would rather be at work than be at home. And so you might not see him a bunch. It's natural. It happens. This is no way to teach anybody. And it's not showing honor and respect. And so what happens is, when the wife yells at the husband, if the husband doesn't just check out, punch out, walk away, or, or do the godly thing, pray for his wife and weep on her shoulder, if that doesn't happen, he's going to start to open his mouth and defend himself. And of course, his volume is going to go higher than hers, right? By the way, men have 30% more lung capacity than a woman. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get in a shouting match with a man... There's a volume thing that's going to happen, and you're going to lose that fight. And if you decide you want to get physical, you know it's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. So don't go there. Don't go there. That is not, and that's what the Bible's talking about. Don't go there. It is, the road is just full of flesh and damage. Don't do it. Just don't do it. And men, same for you. Yelling, demeaning. Being uh, sarcastic at, at sensitive moments like that is no way to lead with love like Jesus at all. And so it has no place in a marriage. But this is ends up what, what happens. If some of your men, ladies, don't obey the word, they might be one without a word. Now, you know, the brain of a woman, her frontal cortex is bigger than a man's. Did you know that? You know why that is? verbal center. That's why women speak twice as many words as a man on an average. You guys, you guys know that? Did we run out of time? You guys want to leave? Okay. <laughs> women speak twice as many words as a man. Look it up. And so why do they want to use your, their words to tell you how they feel and how you should be doing what they tell you? Because that's the way a woman's built. Men don't normally do this because when men get to this level, it's physical, right? Oh, I've, I've seen women in the past, you know, have a big scramble and a big fight, and, and seconds later, they're crying and hugging each other. I'm like, I'm sorry. And all sorts of excuses as to why it happened. Have, have you ever seen that? I, I've seen it, and I was like, That's a, I just saw a miracle. <laughs> Because men don't do that. You see, men are the ones who are not supposed to be bitter towards their wives. Why do you think the scripture says that? Because men tend to be bitter towards their wives. <laughs> Women can forgive much easily, more easily. Now, in today's society, when, you know, strong enough for a man but made for a woman lifestyle, everything changes.
without a word, might be won over when they look at your behavior. Ladies, your best tool for influencing your husband is your behavior, Amen. not your words. When they look at your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, it says, that's respect. When you respect him when he's irrespectable, if that's a word, unrespectable. When you continue to show love towards him unconditionally, even though he's a wretched man, that's going to make a difference. The Bible says so. Don't take my word for it. Try it. And talk to my wife later. <laughs> Do not let your adornment be merely outward, talking to the wives, arranging of the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Any of you fall into one of those three categories today? Did you arrange your hair? Is the, do you have gold or fine apparel on, do you? I want you to notice, it doesn't say that you shouldn't do it. It says that your beauty should not come from these things. I used to work at an office, and uh, I got promoted from the warehouse to the office, and I had to wear nice clothes and buy shoes that hurt my feet, and, you know, and I kind of settled in. But I noticed all of the secretaries, when they would come in, it was like almost on a monthly basis, I, this one secretary that I sat with, she would come in with like lots of jewelry and you could smell the perfume across the room and all of the clothes. And I was like, you got a date this afternoon? Why? Why do you say that? <laughs> well, you, you look beautiful. You got a dress on and you're all dressed up. You got heels on. You don't normally dress that way. And then I realized it happened on a monthly basis. And I realized it was a crutch trying to overcome a sense of unworthiness or dirtiness. And then I realized what it was. There's a hormonal cycle that goes on. And I began to predict it. And I began to say, oh, be careful. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. It exists, people. This is not, a, you know, like a conspiracy theory, it exists. There, there is a hormonal cycle and you should take note and be wise to put it on your phone and take note. Hey, it's coming around at time, you know. PMS is a real thing. I'm 62 years old. I know a couple of things. Don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on apparel. Don't let your beauty come from that. Rather, let it be of the hidden person of the heart, Amen. with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, there are some women who are not known for their gentle, <laughs> quiet spirit. And yet, if you want to be beautiful in God's sight, he says to be gentle and quiet. The word quiet actually means to keep your seat. You know, you're having Thanksgiving and, you know, that drunken uncle shows up and, you know, things begin to get out of hand uh, and she doesn't even get up. She doesn't say anything. She just smiles and cuts a turkey. Everybody else is up disruptive and running around and crazy and yelling at each other, guys, in each other's faces. You drink too much. Oh, yeah, well, you're stupid, you know. <coughs> she keeps her seat. That's what it means. It means you're not stirred by every little wind. It means you keep your seat. You know your place, and you don't stick your nose where it doesn't belong. You don't stick your nose in a place where you're going to have to referee, and you don't get in a place where you're going to start bossing people. You go to the corner, and you shut up and sit down. That is not the gentle and quiet spirit that this is speaking of. A gentle and quiet spirit is to be gentle and quiet. Keep your seat, in case you didn't know. The scripture says it's the inner beauty that God's interested in, not the outer I like to collect shells. There's a few real nice ones. 
You know what's nice about shells? They're beautiful. You know what's really terrible about shells? There's nothing living in there. They're dead bodies. You're collecting corpses on the beach. Unless you're unlucky and you get one that's alive and you take it home and then you know there was something in there because it smells. God is not concerned with the outside. He's concerned with the inside. And men, if you're looking for a wife, look on the inside. Because that's the person you're going to marry. Because the outside changes. Yes, yes. I used to be slim. I used to be young. I used to have a unibrow. All the hair on my body was pretty much where it belonged. I don't have a hair problem. It's just to spread out and left places. So the person you see on the outside is not the person you're going to end up with. The person you're going to end up with is the person of the heart. So when choosing a mate, choose that because the outside changes. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 31 talks about a good woman, talks about the best kind of woman. In fact, it's Solomon's mother who's telling him this advice. And so if you want to see a psalm that looks like it's written by a woman, you might want to read Psalm 30, uh, Proverbs 31, rather. Proverbs 31, 25 to 30 says, Strength and honor are her clothing. It's not about the outside, is it? She shall rejoice in the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household. In other words, she's not lazy. She takes care of things. And does not eat the bread of idleness. In other words, she's not lazy. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Why? <laughs> it's not because she forces them to. It's because she's worthy of it. Her children rise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Why? Because of her chaste conduct accompanied with fear. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Wives, wouldn't you want to hear that from your husband? Like, you know what? There's a lot of good women in this world, but you're the best. Don't you want to hear that? Don't you want to know that your husband's eyes are for you and you alone? Of course you do. Well, that takes some doing, unfortunately, on the man's part and the woman's part. Verse 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. Amen? Amen. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Amen. Ladies, you do what the Lord wants you to do, and you will have praise from God and from others. If you're going to walk in the flesh, you're going to force everybody away from you. You're going to... How many, how many young people in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, growing up in the society that believe the lie? I don't need no man. When they're 40 and they're 50 years old, look back on their life and say, oh my God, what have I done? They have no friends. They might have a job where they have lots of money and they have outward adornment and gold and pearls and they might have all that, but they have no children. They have no family. They're, your family, are, most of them are older than you. They die off and you get left alone. The lie that you should not get married for the sake that it shows some kind of a crazy dependence is a lie. Amen. Could I have lived without my wife? Probably. I would not be the same person I am. Because she forces me to change. <laughs> Listen, let me embarrass my wife. She gets up before me. And she goes and opens her Bible, and she opens her journal, and she spends time with Jesus. You know what I wake up to? Hi, honey. She gives me a kiss. My breath is out of sorts. My hair is out of sorts. <laughs> I'm dressed out of sorts, and she doesn't care. She loves me. You know why? Because she spent time with Jesus. 
Men, if you're not married, find a woman who loves Jesus and you will become more like him and she will be God's number one instrument in your life. Trust me. Or don't. Matthew Henry describes a gentle, meek spirit as the silent submission of a soul to the providence of God concerning us. A woman who knows her God will put her hope in God and find her rest in God. She calms and quiets her soul, and she does not flail and strive against the God who is her refuge and who determines her circumstances. You see, a submission to your husband shows that you trust God. Not him. Amen? Amen. It shows that you have a quiet, stayed dependence upon the God who changes everything. And trust me, he can change your husband's heart easily. But he probably needs you to get on board with doing the things you need to do. I took some pictures off the internet of all these outwardly beautiful women. And I realize it's a problem. I, 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 I could be causing trouble here. There's always a chance of comparing. But do you see, if this is all you have, you're going to be a very miserable person because this all goes away, right? And it's an amazing thing when, when I, I remember being young and of course, when I was going to high school, you know, you, you kind of look through it, you try to cruise the place and figure out who, who the prettiest girl is, and you go, wow, she's really pretty, way out of my league. And so what you do is you try to get near her and, you know, oh, hi, how are you? you know, just, no, this isn't my locker, I was standing here, you know. <laughs> you know how goofy boys can be. And some women, the minute they open their mouth, Beautiful girl, she's got everything. Hi, how are you? <laughs> you know. How? You can build up in your mind what you think this person's like, and then as soon as they open their mouth, you're like, I'm sorry, I think somebody wants me. <laughs> and you're out of there. Because sometimes we build up in our mind what is on the outside. We think the inside's got to match. And it doesn't always. And we tend to just look at the outside. You see, God looks at the heart. And that's the important part. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. If you're a Christian, that is, the true, that is the true statement. That the outside is worrying away. Because you know what? You can't go to heaven in this suit. You're underdressed. And it's wearing away day by day. And, you know, you might color it up. You might uh, primp it up. You might, you know, tuck it in and squeeze it tight. And you might do everything you want to look like you once were. But it, guess what? It's going away. The scripture says so. I believe it. But inside, because of Christ in our life, because we're looking to be his person, we're being renewed day by day. Do you know that's the possibility for those who are Christians? That you're being renewed day by day. You people are sitting here listening to a message from the word of God. You have the opportunity to, to leave this place stronger than when you walked in because the word of God instructs us. We're being renewed day by day, and I hope that's the case for you guys. I really do. Proverbs 31, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. It's not about all the stuff on the outside, regardless of what all the magazines tell you. For in this matter, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. You guys remember Abraham and Sarah, right? Abraham, God came to him when he was 75 years old. He goes, you're going to have a son. He goes, really? 
Yeah. You're going to have a son. In fact, he's going to be, he's going to have more children and you're going to have families all over the earth. It's going to be like the stars in the sky, like the sand on the seashore. Oh, cool. His, his wife was 10 years younger than him. So there's some hope. <laughs> Except 25 years later, the promise is yet unfulfilled. Abraham's 100 years old. He got impatient. His wife said, well, maybe God didn't mean what he said. That's a common lie, isn't it? Maybe he meant that you should lie with our maid and propagate children. Little did he know the problem he caused, because that's not what God meant. And yet, Sarah, not being a perfect person, is one of the only persons listed in chapter 11 in Hebrews in the Hall of Faith. One of the only women there. And she called her husband Lord. Gentlemen, do not, do not walk away from this message and say, Pastor Dave said you should call me Lord. <laughs> because such respect cannot be coerced. I'm just saying. Hebrews 11, 11, by faith, Sarah also herself received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Amen. You see an old woman in 99 years old who has a baby, and you go, wow, is that your great-great-grandchild? No, that's my baby. Your baby? I mean, that's pretty crazy. But it says, by faith, she trusted God that he would do it. But they didn't start that way. And she called her husband, Lord. He even said, listen, I want you to lie for me when we go in. You know, the guys are going to be looking at you, and you're a pretty good looker, and I'm afraid I'm going to lose you. So you know what? Lie to him. Don't tell him you're my wife. Tell him you're my sister, which is somewhat of a half-truth. And so Abimelech lays eyes on her. Somebody said, yeah, there's a hottie just moved in. Oh, yeah? I'll have to check her out. Bring her to me. And Abraham had to watch his wife go into the house of another man, where he looks her up and down to see if she's worthy to be married to him. And she submitted herself to her husband and didn't give up the jig, you know? And suddenly, nobody could have sexual relations in that country, because God put a stop on all the drive in all the men and said, something's wrong here. I don't find women attractive anymore. <laughs> because God put a stop to it because Sarah was in the house. And God protected her when her own husband wouldn't tell the truth and stand up. And it's worse than that because he did it twice. Yep. So she didn't become this person overnight, but she became a person who was respectful towards her husband. A woman in Christ knows her Bible, knows her theology, and a sovereign God who makes promises, knows his promises to be with her no matter what. She draws strength down from this, and a certain kind of tree grows up from this message, deep, uh, this massive deep root of hope in God. This hope in God yields fearlessness. A woman who fears God is to be praised. A woman who looks to God for her strength is to be praised. And a wife who is able to submit to her husband, it's only because her relationship with God is deep. And without that, I'm sorry, ladies, you don't really have much, uh, much to go on because men are just knuckleheads. I'm telling you, I'm one of them. Husbands, oh, we're finally getting to the husbands. But it's only just a short verse. <laughs> husbands, likewise, dwell with them, meaning your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Some ladies chafe at that. But if you want to try arm wrestling after this, we could <laughs> see if it's true. And being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Guys, we're out of time. I will pick it up from, I got six whole verses done today. Good. 
We're out of the danger zone. <laughs> now, I hope, I hope you guys understand my heart with this. I am not a male chauvinist pig, and I value women. I love women, but I love my wife more. I do what the scripture tells me to do as much as I can. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Man, that is, that is the response to us having a right relationship with God and knowing that we have married his daughter. And if I don't treat her well, her dad's going to be mad at me. That's the fact. I hope you guys will do this naturally. As the worship team comes up, I'd like you guys to uh, just take this with you and muddle it over, read it again, and see if the Lord doesn't speak to your heart some of this stuff and encourage you. Amen.